Hello everyone and welcome to this new section in which we'll see how to implement data augmentation using a specialized data augmentation library called Albumentations. We'll see how to use Albumentations with TensorFlow and also PyTorch, which will permit us to see how easy it is for us to integrate Albumentation with just any library. Note that this session was inspired by a question posed by one of us. Feel free to always ask questions as this will permit us better this course. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you never miss amazing content like this. We shall be looking at the Albumentation tool which is a specialized data augmentation library. Albumentation is a Python library for fast and flexible image augmentations. It efficiently implements a rich variety of image transform operations that is optimized for performance and does so well providing a concise yet powerful image augmentation interface for different computer vision tasks including object classification, segmentation, and detection. Now we'll look at why we need a dedicated library like Albumentations. Here in the documentation, they argue that if you're to do this kind of usual data augmentation, there are a host of libraries like TensorFlow which we've seen already which do this kind of data augmentation. But then, when carrying out data augmentation with different tags like say object detection like in this case or let's take this for example here which is more illustrative you have this image as input and this bounding boxes which will permit you build a model for object detection but then if you were to do data augmentation and then you want to augment this data by applying cropping like as you could see here notice how this image right here has been cropped like we, what we have now is something like this part or rather this part actually now notice you have cropped out this whole image and you're left only with this i think it's it goes right up so it should be something like this um yeah something like this okay so you have you've cropped this image and it's part of your data augmentation pipeline so let's um take this off and this off as we were saying you crop this image and here's what you get now with the usual data augmentation methods or working with the usual libraries, what you have to do is after doing this cropping, you would have to manually modify each and every bounding box you find here. See this bounding box is right here. Oh, this one's not taken into consideration because it's not part of this crop. So you have to modify each and every bounding box you find here. This red bounding box is right here. And this is because these bounding boxes are got or uh, they get the positions with respect to this origin right here or in this case respect to this origin and so when you do this cropping the obviously this positions change now instead of doing this manually augmentation permits you to get this restructuring of this bounding boxes automatically without having to manually modify them and apart from object detection, another very common use case is in image segmentation. We have this original image, which has been transformed into this one. And then uh, the image has a mask. So you are trying to segment the different parts of this image. And so after you've applied this rotation, you now get augmentation to apply the same rotation in the outputs. Another reason why using augmentations is advantageous is the fact that it has this declarative definition of the augmentation pipeline and provides a unified interface. So basically this is what it takes to build our augmentation pipeline. Now notice how with this, we can also include this probabilities. So you see here probability 0 0.3 and this probability 0 0.5. Now stating that this brightness contrast augmentation will get a probability of 0 0.3 simply means that you're going to apply random brightness contrast three times for every 10 images you process. And this means that if you have a data set of, let's say, um, let's say we have a data set of 10,000 uh, images. We have this data set of 10,000 images. Then what our model will see or the probability of our model getting the original images is in this case of P equals 0 0.3. 0 0.7 so we have a probability or uh, it is most probable that we will get 7,000 out of this 10,000 from the original data set which our model sees 
and then we have 3000 which is going to be augmented then you also have this horizontal flip so you have the 0 0.5 so this means that you could pass in an image and then there is no bright brightness contrast and there is no horizontal flip same as you could pass in an image and you have the random brightness contrast and you don't have this or uh, you may not have this and you have this or uh, you may not we've seen this already or you may have this and have this but with this random crop you will always have it because here there's no probability specified then also it's advantageous to make use of augmentation because it has been regularly tested as you can see it has been battle tested used widely in the industry deep learning research machine learning competitions and open source projects high performance diverse set of supported augmentations extensibility and rigorous testing we also have here this list of transforms and the supported targets as you could see this list is broken up into two parts we have the pixel level transforms and we have the spatial level transform so if you want to get more information for each and every one of the transforms it suffices just to click on this so you just you could say for example let's pick this sharpen right here click on the sharpen and you have here the arguments and their description let's take another example from the spatial level transforms here we could take the vertical flip so we click on this vertical flip you see we have this float probability of applying the transform default 0.5 now note that if you're dealing with a very large data set that is if your initial data set is very large then you could use probabilities between 0.1 and 0.3 reason being that since your data set is already large it doesn't need data augmentation that much now if you're dealing with a small medium sized data set you could use probabilities between 0.4 to 0.5 nonetheless you could always pick whatever value depending on how it affects your model performance getting back to the code we're going to make use of this example tensorflow data augmentation pipeline build with augmentations so here we have the transforms and then we have the augmentation function then data preprocessing and finally integration with tensorflow data sets now based on the kind of data set we're dealing with we have to be very careful in the data set augmentation strategies we're going to be using so like yeah we could use this random rotate because rotation doesn't wipe off those sections which contain information that permits us to differentiate between a parasitized and an uninfected cell getting back to our random rotate 90 you have here um, this argument a float which is a probability of applying this transform default 0 0.5 so we could make use of this random rotate right here then just below we have other different rotations we have the random rotate 90 apply which rotates the image a certain number of times we have the geometric rotate where we can select the angle at which we'll do the rotation then we have this uh, safe rotate would we'll avoid this kind of um, data augmentation strategies like the cropping because yeah you could crop out information which permits us differentiate between the parasitized and uninfected cells you also have this resize here which we will use in um, pre-processing our images we have the vertical flip and the horizontal flip which we are going to use so here we have horizontal and vertical flip let's add that here we can also do just a flip we also have this random grid shuffle which we could make use of this randomly shuffles grid cells in an image meaning that if we have this kind of image and then we've picked a grid size of three by three we could break this up this way uh, you break this up and then you have this three by three grid cell and then you simply randomly shuffle this position so this one can end up here this ends up here this ends up here and so on and so forth we could also have this random brightness contrast so with this one we'll take this all and then paste it right here random brightness contrast the next one let's take this sharpen so that's it um you could use other data augmentation strategies you want always make sure that you visualize the outputs to better understand exactly what you're using 
Now we define our transforms. We have our transforms, argumentation, compose, and then we have this list which is made of the different augmentations. Yeah, we just copy this out. Let's have this copied. But before this, let's do a resize. So here we could have a dot resize, and then we specify the image size, and that's it. So we specify the image size. We're going for the horizontal and vertical flip. So let's copy this out. There we go. You have that horizontal vertical flip. For this random brightness contrast, we're going to use the default parameters. Sharpen, we're going to use the default parameters. And that's it. We now have our transforms. So we could run the cell. We get in this error. And this is because right here we have to have this. So it's argumentation. This is gotten from argumentation. We run this again. We get in some errors. Argumentation has no attribute sharpen. Even when we comment this one, we will also get this error. Argumentation has no attribute random grid shuffle. So we will just comment this too and then run that again. Okay, that's fine. That looks fine. We can also implement this argumentation one off with this one off either the vertical flip or the horizontal flip so let's take this out of this here and put it right here we have one of horizontal flip or the vertical flip now we're gonna have this here and then so we have this list actually we're gonna create this list and it's gonna be made of this two transformations which is the vertical and the horizontal flip let's have this here and close this Okay, so we have uh, defined that one off, and then we could also specify a probability. So let's take p equals 0 0.3, for example, and there we go. This probability here actually defines whether the one off will be applied or not. And so we have that. We could run this again, and that's fine. Drawing inspiration from this method given in the documentation, we are going to create this our own method, arc argument which takes in an image, creates this dictionary, fits this information in the transforms which we've created here, and then normalizes the image. So this is what we do with this arc albumment method. From here, we could have our training data set, similar to what we've been doing already, but with the difference that instead of this, we have now process data, Getting back to the documentation, in this process data here, we have, let's copy out this process data. In this process data, what we are actually doing, let's add this cell here. In this process data, we're taking the image, we're taking the label, we're taking the image size, and then the actually modify this image and have this, and then um, take this label and pass it to the output since the label remains unchanged. Now for this image size, we wouldn't need this, so we could take that off. We're just taking the image and the label size, and then as this input, we pass in the image. Uh, the tensor out uh, is going to be of data type float32. The function is going to be arc albumment. So arc albumment is our function. And then we are going to make use of this tensorflow numpy function. Now getting to documentation, we see uh, it wraps a Python function and uses it as a tensorflow operation that said we could still work in the graph mode even though we are having this python code right here and this is because our tensorflow is going to convert everything that goes on in here as a tensorflow operation so we could run this we have the process data that looks fine we could run this too and then finally we have our train data set so we run our train data set batch size not defined we should have run this year okay we run the cell and then getting back we run this again you should be fine now okay so here we have train data set we could look at that and that looks fine we can quickly visualize our data set we have the image the level and then we have an element pick from our data set so now let's im show this im show im we run that we get this error because we are dealing with batches of 32 so let's just pick one of these elements 
let's run that now and that should be fine okay so here's what we obtain then we could have many more plots so we have this figure we define the figure size for i in range 1 to 32 we want to have plot that subplot subplot 8 4 and then i and then plot that im show our image i okay we run that and here's what we get so we have this and now what we could do is well, let's let's get this cut out which we have here in the documentation specify a number of holes maximum height size maximum width size the fill value always apply false and the probability so when we apply this you're going to see exactly uh, or better understand all these different arguments right here so let's go ahead and apply cut out which should be more visible as compared to the other transformation like the rotations that we did so here let's have this here let's you see how easy it is now to integrate any data augmentation strategy you have so here we have a uh, then paste that a cut out and then we take the default parameters we have the cut out let's run that again and uh, what we need to do because the train data set has been modified so we need to like get the initial train data set we had after getting from here let's get back down and then check this out okay so we have done the transform or albumments run this run this and now we could visualize okay yeah the cutout hasn't been implemented that is obviously there's a probability of 0 0.5 so it's possible that we don't have cut out here now if you look at this you see clearly that in some parts of this let's increase the size let's say 15 okay as we're saying if you look at this you'll notice that in some parts or in some images we have this portions which have been cut out so you could see for example with this one you have this part which is cut out and then getting back to the documentation we have here default number of holes eight and we could copy all this out and then modify it so you see how this could change the kind of output we get because here you see when there's cut out we have one two three four five uh, surely you have the other holes or cut out regions in the black spot so you can identify them and then here you have one two three four you see you even have this looks like a cut out anyway that's the idea you specify the number of cut out or number of regions you want to cut out you also specify the value it's going to take so like in this case when you specify zero it simply means you're going to be having this black spots here so let's have that um back here okay so let's put this in here and then you have number of holes so that's it you could modify this and observe exactly what goes on to increase the size of the cutout region you could simply specify uh, the values here and then you have the fill value you have this boolean always apply and then you have the probability so if you want to always have cut out you could simply send this probability to one and that's how it works so we've seen how this works we could go ahead and train our model using this our augmented data but before training let's take out the cut out as it was just meant to show you how this works okay so let's rerun this again run this and then we visualize as you could see now there is no cut out region so that's as expected that said we'll move forward to training our model again so we run that training process so here are the results we get after training for several epochs you'll notice that the accuracy doesn't go up to 99 percent as it used to be before and also with this validation accuracy we even get better results here's a result we get after training for several epochs notice how here the accuracy doesn't get as high as it used to be before so the accuracy we get getting now is uh the highest value of accuracy we get is like 94.5 percent and the validation accuracy we get in here it's about that like the highest we get in here is like 94.48 percent and this is the accuracy versus epoch plot we now get also after checking on augmentations github page we found this solution to this problems we're getting here 
where we weren't able to make use of the cut out or rather we weren't able to make use of the sharpen and the random grid shuffle so yeah when we do this install we should have here and then uncomment the sections you should now have this working the next part of this section will be based on this question posed by one of us and he proposes that we should store images for a few different individual augmentations that is uh let's say five different augmentations and train on this data well as a reminder you can always feel free to ask any question in the comment and we'll do our best to reply in the shortest possible time now that said let us see how to combine different data sets so suppose we have the three data sets right here uh data one data two data three you could let's let's test for data one so you could see that let's say for d in data set one or let's say data set two we're gonna print out d there we go as you could see data set two is composed of values between one and seven obviously we, we weren't taking the last position so it's from one up to six now to combine this we could create our combined data set which is equal data set one let's say we have data set one dot concatenate concatenate and then we're going to pass in data set two then this is obviously going to be a new data set and then from this new data set we're going to concatenate data set three so here we have data set three and then let's run this now so you see how we are able to combine all those three data sets together we run that and then for d in combined data set let's print out d we now have this data set made of the three different data sets we have here so we go from 8 to 10 see 8 to 10 and then 1 to 6 and then 12 to 15 so that's good now that said let's take a look at this transforms we had here so essentially what he is proposing is that instead of having this transforms put as one single let's have this as uh let's let, we're gonna take four different transforms and then one will be just the original data set and from that we have this augment one which is resize rescale uh random brightness resize rescale that's augment two resize rescale random flip up down the next resize rescale flip left right next uh rotation by 90 degrees then finally we have the original data so here we're not gonna have any augmentation we just have the resizing and rescaling okay that looks fine we define the train data set one train data set one is this with augment one train data set two let's let's have this others let's add this code cells we have train data set two and uh, three and uh, four and five okay anyway let's let's have this two we have here three there we go then four and five where five is the original data set and then four three two and one are augmented data sets now once we have this we could have our complete data set or let's say our full data set uh which is equal data set one concatenated with data set two concatenated with data set three data set four and finally data set five so we now have combined all these data sets let's add this code cell and shuffle again and put into batches now note that before this we don't we do not need to have this prefetching so we could take this off no prefetching no batching um year two yeah we're only shuffling and mapping so we could take all this off and then we'll do this at the end so we'll have that off take this off and that's fine now coming back here we have the the the, the full data set which is what we have here we have our full data set and then just in here full data set okay so we have this full data set we shuffle we no no need for any mapping again we put this in batches and then prefetching from here we have our full data set full data set and that looks good okay so we have this full data set now and then we take the sequential api we go ahead and retrain our model notice now that during training this number year has increased by five since our data set has been replicated five times we are now done with the training and here are the results we get we see that the accuracy or highest accuracy after training for 16 epochs here is 97.44 percent while that of the validation accuracy 
is 95.79%. Now this happens with the highest validation accuracy we've had so far. And with this validation accuracy, we had 33 false negatives and 83 false positives, which looks quite good. And this tells us that increasing or repeating our data set um, came up with better results, though our training time has almost tripled. We also have this plot for the loss and the accuracy right here. Notice how we have this more stable validation accuracy values after, uh, say, the seed epoch. And that's it for the subsection. We're now going to move to implementing augmentation with PyTorch. Now, the reason why we're working with PyTorch with this uh, augmentation section is actually because one of us demanded a tutorial on PyTorch and augmentation. And since we are working on a TensorFlow series, we had to first do this uh, implement augmentation in TensorFlow. And now we're going to do the same with PyTorch. We are now going to get started with the imports in the PyTorch code. Here we have the usual imports. We're going to import uh, Torch and Torch Vision. We're going to import transforms from Torch Vision, data set, and data loader for loading our data. And the Adam optimizer, albumentations, which we've seen already, neural networks, and the functional API. So we run the cell and then we get into the data processing and loading. But unlike before where we we're dealing with this tensorflow code we actually got this directly from tensorflow data sets but then with pytorch we are gonna have to make use of this data set which is provided to us by arunava and this cargo data set so that said we have this you see it's still the same to 27,558 images we had with the tensorflow data sets so we have the parasitized and the uninfected just as we expect. Now the next thing to do will be to load this data. In order to load this data, we're going to make use of this provided by Kaggle. So we'll install this Kaggle package right here. And then we're going to import. So we're going to make sure we import this um, files from google.colab. Let's run this again. And then from here, after this installation, we're going to do a file upload. Then what you do is you come to your profile, you have this account, you get to this create new API token. You click on this and you should be able to download this Kaggle.json. Now we, you have this Kaggle.json file, you get back here. There we go, we select this file, that's it. You see, it gets automatically loaded. And then we're gonna follow these two steps. We're gonna create this directory and then we're gonna copy this file into this directory. So we, do, we run the, just that. Uh, can I start Kaggle no file directory? Um, let's check out here. Now let's modify this name. So let's rename this to Kaggle. Okay, so we have Kaggle.json. Let's run this again. This should be fine. Oh, now you're, you're getting this other error because this already exists. So let's comment this and then run this now. Okay, so you see that's fine. We've copied this uh, file into our directory. And then we could now download this. Our data set now if you get back to the Kaggle you'll see that just here if you click on this here you should be able to copy this API command so clicking on that here let's add a command code cell you paste it see is that code we get here so this code is gotten from that and so if you have a new data set you're trying to get from Kaggle you can just simply follow the steps now we run this and that should be fine we get this other error. Your Kaggle API is readable by other users on the system. To fix this, you can run this command. So we're just going to copy this command and run that. We just copy that, paste it right here, and then run the command. That looks fine. Let's now run this again. Now we're getting this error because we didn't use the most recent Kaggle JSON file we generated. So let's get back here and uh, let's add this code cell. We have files upload. Let's run that. Uh, we take this and take this most recent file because this already expired. So we take that and then that should this should work this time around. So yeah, we should have our cargo two. Okay, now let's let's delete this. Let's delete this, and that should be fine. Now let's rename and we have cargo.json. 
we have cargo.json now um we could copy let's copy this into that cargo folder and then we have cargo data set download this time around so let's run this and we see that this works now perfect we are downloading this whole data set after downloading you'll notice that we have this zip here so it's actually a compressed file now the next thing we could do is unzip this compressed file so we're going to unzip this and we'll see how we get you see we have this here you could try to rename and then you copy this out so this is how we copy this and then just pasted it right here let's let's take this off and paste so you see how we get this so we paste that there and that should be fine so now we have this and then we could run this unzip command you can see how this is unzipping let's take this up okay so next time you do this we run this command before downloading so you don't have um any problems or any warnings now as this is unzipped we could check here and see that we have this cell images and the cell images we have this parasitized and the uninfected it takes a while to open because we have so many files in here okay this has been loaded you can see here we have all these different files you could check out on all these different files here um here are the files we get for the this should be the uninfected or parasitized and then uninfected okay so that's it let's reduce this and then check out reduce that and that's it okay so that's it. we could close that and then see here all those different files we've gotten all with unzipped so that's it we have our files now we could now go ahead and create a torch data set so we're supposing that you don't have any idea about how these data sets are created in PyTorch. So we'll go step by step on how they work. We need to basically create a list of all the file paths. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to create a simple list which contains all these different file paths. There we go. We have this train paths parasitized, uh, train paths uninfected. And then for the train paths parasitized, we're going to list dire or we're gonna make use of this list dire method the OS which is gonna take uh, or get into this cell images parasitized and then get us all the file names so let's print out this train paths parasitized so you get to see what we're talking about let's close this up you can see here you see we have all these file names if you run if you have this length of this you should get about 13,000 values okay so that's it so that's our list which contains all the different file names you notice that it's just the file names and not the file path just this file name just this but we're interested in getting the file path right from the cell images and specifying exactly which folder to belong to so that's it for this train path parasitized we could repeat the same for the train path uninfected but before repeating that what we'll do is we'll have the train paths parasitized equal and then we're gonna attach this path here so not just a file name but the path so we have this equal cell images because it's parasitized we're gonna have this parasitized and then plus i for i in for i in train paths parasitized now what we're gonna have here is um, the stream path parasitized, which contains the paths. Okay, so that's exactly what we want. We could take this off and then repeat the same process for the uninfected. Here we have uninfected. There we go. We take this off. Specify uninfected here, and that's it. Now note that there are, there's uh, an easy way of doing this. Like you could we could make use of the fact that this is organized in these two folders to quickly create our data set but we're following this path so that you could create any kind of data set when given just any type of data from here we combine the two paths we have this path which is made of this two and then we remove these two files it happens that there are these two files which you check here there's this uh, tom's db file and for same for the parasitize so we we take this two off and once we take this two off we are gonna do a random shuffling of this paths so we random shuffle our paths we specify this fraction this fraction represents um the training data 
fraction. So here we are saying that 80% of our, of our data will be for training and 20% for validation. So here we have this training paths and it's gonna take paths and then from zero to 80% and validation paths from 80% right to the end. So that's it. Now you could print out the LAN of val paths and uh, the LAN of train paths. So that should give you this. So there we go, we have this 5,000, 22,000. So this is our data set now created. Or rather, this this list now created, we could go ahead and create our data set. Let's add this code cell right here. There we go, we create this uh, malaria data set, which inherits from data set. So we, we get this, and then we have our constructor. There we go, we have this constructor. We specify the image file paths. That's this file paths we've just created right here. So we specify the image file paths and then the transforms. Remember, we are trying to show how to implement or make use of augmentation to implement data augmentation. So we have those transforms, transforms and default none. That's it. In here, we have our image file paths which is equal image file paths and then we have the transform transform equal transforms okay so we have this constructor then we have this len method the aim of this len method is to give us the exact size of our data set so since we we have all this listed in our uh, in this list here since we've listed all this in this list paths what we'll do now is if we get the length of the paths then it means we've gotten the length of our full data set so that said we have to return the length of this image file paths here and now we get this length we could go ahead and create in this get item method this get item method will permit us to process each and every element of our data set based on an index. So from here we have this and then we have the image which we'll read using OpenCV. So we have CV2 in read and then we're going to use this file paths here. So we have this self the fi image file paths. Let's take let's have this and then put it out in here. Once we have this file paths we specify a particular index. Recall that this is just the list. Now we want to get the particular index or the particular image we are dealing with. So we get this index and that's our image. Once we get the image, what's left to do now is to obtain the label. To obtain this level, we suppose that if this uh, image, that's what we get here, if the index or rather the indexed file path has this parasitized then in that case that's if this is equal parasitized then we are gonna have the label to be equal zero now if you reverse with this let's we could we could copy this out and so you see exactly how it works let's paste this here recall we have the paths so we could Let's add this code. We could, if we have paths, you see, we get this very long list. Now, let's say, for example, one path zero. Path zero gives us this. And then, in this case, you could see that's uninfected. So, given that's uninfected, if you say path zero, that splits. And then splits and based on this slash, you would have this new list. So, you see, we have this new list. And then, what we're going to do now is compare. If we have the first element because this is the zero element the first element and the second element if this first element equal uninfected then we set it to, to a one if it's parasitized then it's zero so here we should add this we should add this one okay this looks fine take this off and label equals zero else uh, we have the label equal one that's look okay we now return our image and the label but note that before returning this if we have a transform so if transform uh what we're gonna do is transform our image so image will not just be just the image but 
transformed image we have transform of image yeah we actually have the self dot transform okay so that's it we have that now we've created this data set we could run the cell let's take this off we have a malaria data set now created let's take this off then we paste out the exact same transformations we had let's take this ones off so we have that exact same transformations uh we have this horizontal vertical random rotate random brightness contrast and sharpen we've discussed all this already so now we just make use of this transforms so from here we run the cell once we run the cell we now create our train data set we're getting this error m size not defined let's um define this year we could we could just simply let's define it here so we have your m size m size equal 224 we run that and run this we're getting this error has no attribute sharpen so let's um let's have this here and then install pip install directly from this repository now we've installed this what do we have more restart the runtime so we restart the runtime after restarting when we now run the cell you see everything works so this is our transforms which we've defined and now we're ready to create our train and validation data set transforms not defined they should be transforms so we have this transforms and that's it so we've defined our transforms and this okay so you could see here from this based on this transforms you pass in here we are able to modify the image we are now set for creating our train loader so we have this train loader data loader it's actually data loader data loader we pass in our train data set train data set we are going to specify the batch size so we have your batch size equal the batch size which we're going to define so we have specified the batch size and then shuffle equal true shuffle equal true um let's put in the batch size here we have our batch size equal 32. we have defined a batch size we've specified that we want to do shuffling and now we have this data loader which will load our data in batches and feed it to the model we then repeat the same process for the validation we have train the loader and validation loader basically we have your val loader and val data set modified so that looks okay we've specified the batch size shuffle true but we don't really need that here so we could take this off so by default the shuffling should be false so that's it we now have the cell we run this and then let's add this cell below so here we have our input or let's say we have our image we have the label um we get one element or we get one batch so we pass in our train loader train loader and that should be fine we get this error now that we get this error we have to ensure that we pass in the transforms here we actually took this off so let's have this transforms and then transforms so we run this again and we get this new error this time around so here we are told you have to pass data to augmentations as named arguments for example we have this transformation and then when we pass this image we have to pass it as a name argument so coming back here what we're gonna do is we're gonna have this image equal image we run this again and see what we get this time around everything works well we should have your image and uh, the label so we have the image in the label and we run this we get the image label and once we have this image label we could now do an im show so let's view this image we get this result we told image data of data type object cannot be converted to a float so let's get back here and then if we go back to the tensorflow code you will notice that at this point we actually pick this image so after you've gotten this image and you want to do the transformation that's when you've done, done this transformation you are going to select the image from this transformed object image so getting back here what we'll do is we're going to have um here we're going to have this image selected so let's rerun this again and see what we get this works fine we plot and now we have a different arrow here we told we have an invalid shape 
So let's just pick out the zeroth element and this should work. Okay, so that's fine. Now we see how we get this uh, transformed output. Let's include cut out because, or let's just simply put cut out here since cut out permits us to see clearly that we're actually doing some transformations. So we have this cut out probably equal one and that's fine. Let's run all that and we should get a cut out output. So that's it. But then we are not using cut out. So let's take this off. Let's get back to this. We have plotted our image and we see what we get. Now we could always plot this and plot the levels side by side. So uh, we have this and uh, we get in this error. Uh, okay, we put this in the im show. Let's let's have this out. Let's print this out actually. So we should have this. Take this off and this should be fine now. We have the image printed and the label. So this is a parasitized cell and this actually looks like a parasitized cell. So we are having our parasitized cell and uh, we are now ready to go on to build a model. To build this same Lunet model we build with TensorFlow, we are going to inherit from PyTorch's model class. And then we're going to have this init method and the forward method. This forward method is similar to the call method we had when we were building this with TensorFlow. Here again, we also have this init, so we have this models which have been, or these layers which have been defined, and then in the call method, we are just gonna basically call all this based on the input data. And so here we have this input, and then we have the forward and this init. In this init method, we're gonna define our different layers. So here we have this conf1, which is this 2D convolutional layer, um, input number of channels need to be specified unlike with tensorflow where we didn't need to specify this but now we recall that our data is of the shape 224 by 224 by 3 so it's because of this that we're specifying that our input number of channels will be 23 since we have three channels now also note that pytouch by default takes in data of this form so it's inside 3 by 224 by 224 so here we are going to modify this or we're going to leave from this to this while doing the training but for now just consider that your number of input channels equals three and then you could specify a number of output channels which here was specified to be six um you could refer to the linear model for all those details so here we have the six output channels we have a kernel size of three stride of one pattern of one that's our conf 2d and this is conf one now the next is our batch norm 2d which takes uh, as parameter six, which matches up with this output channels here. Max pool 2D, pool size equal two, number of strides equal two. We have the dropout 2D, we specify the dropout rate for regularization purposes. We repeat the same process for this next, but here we are not gonna include dropout. So here we just have the conf, batch norm, and max pool. After this, we have this linear layer. Now the way we got this value here, is by getting the output from this, flattening it, and then getting the total number of neurons we have. And this gave us this value. From here, we have this linear layer. And unlike in TensorFlow, where all we need to do was to specify this dense layer, that's the number of outputs. Here we have to know the number of inputs and the number of outputs. So that's why it's important to get this value. Now we get this, we do batch normalization. And note that here we have batch norm. 2d and batch norm 1d and now we're dealing with this 1d batch norm because the output from this has been flattened or will be flattened so here we have the batch norm 1d linear layer again batch norm 1d and then this linear layer notice how we get from 100 output year input 100 output year 10 input year 10 and then the output equal one since we are having a binary classification problem now at this point we could go ahead and input information for this forward layer let's take this one step back that's fine so there we go so now well, what we're going to do is we have this output which is going to be our input being passed into this conf1 so we have um self dot conf1 which takes in our input and then once we get this output we are going to again pass this into this bn or uh, into the the relu actually because we gonna do the relu before the batch norm. So let's first of all do the relu. Now to make use of the relu, you just need to make use of this functional um, API here. So here we have um, imported 
torch functional as f so let's get back to this we have now that f dot relu so here we're gonna have f dot relu and that's how it works so f dot relu we take that and then after getting this output we now patch it pass it into the batch norm so let's have this uh batch norm bn1 we have self dot bn1 bn1 we pass that we get our output then next and uh, we have pull one and then drop out one so here again we put this we have this two actually because we're gonna have self dot pull pull one and then we also gonna have self dot drop out one so that's it so this is how we get this output now once we get this output we repeat the same process for the next like for this next three layers we've we've done with this already we now take a look at this so here we have conf2 bn2 pull2 and just pasting it out here should work fine um notice how instead of passing the input now we pass the output so here we have output we have conf2 we have relu we have bn2 we have pull2 but no drop out so that's how it works so we have our output and that's fine we have this output here at this point since we are going to be doing the flattening and we don't know exactly what our output will look like we will build this model this way so we'll consider this model and then we'll pass in some inputs so here we have our model let's run it uh we have this error network not defined this should be the net okay yeah here is the net so the net we run that again and that should be fine okay so here we have this here and then we could now pass in our input so we have model which takes in um torch torch dot zeros and then here we specify three by two forty four by two twenty four by two twenty four um that's it we could add the batch dimension let's say we yeah we let's have the batch of by size of one okay so we have this let's monitor the shape we have the shape and uh, what do we get we have this six uh one by 16 by 56 by 56 so this means that after flattening we should get this output that's obviously the batch dimension or batch size by 16 times 56 times 56 so this is what we get after flattening now what we're going to use for flattening here is the view method so here we just have output equal output dot view and then uh we just say negative one to say take whatever value whatever batch size and then we are going to have this 16 by 16 by 56 so this tells us that this is actually what we're going to have after flattening let's run this we should get the value 5 50,176 so that's why we chose this actually now you know how this was gotten that's fine we now go ahead and then pass in our linear layers so here we have output again output which is equal self dot um, fc let's call it fc3 fc3 which takes in the output and then after this we have our relu f the relu after the relu we have self dot b and three so that's what we get there we get that output we repeat the same process and then we get that's bn4 now so we should have bn4 and then your fc4 so we, that's how we get this output like we're done with this part now and then finally we have this year so finally we have output equal self dot fc5 and uh, it takes in the output so now we we have what we expect if you run this you see it should work fine uh this is invalid for input type of size this if you look at this you see we made an error here this should be 56 here we should have 56 here we run in we now have this output here so we see that we have um, exactly what we expect let's take this off and run this directly so here's what we get now okay that said we've built the model let's specify the device that's or uh, whether we're going to be using the gpu or we're going to be using the cpu so here we have torch the device CUDA if torch the CUDA is available now if you get to our runtime and we check on the change runtime type you see 
we haven't known so we need, if we go to the, we need to get the gpu to have that anyway let's let's lift this this way and then we'll get the device and after we change that so here we have this and then we have the loss function here we have binary cross entropy loss provided by torch and then we have the optimizer the atom optimizer which we had imported earlier on we specify also the learning rate and then here we have model which we've just defined here dot parameters okay so let's run this and then print out the device uh what do we have for device we have a cpu let's go ahead and change this change runtime type gpu save it and uh, we get this because when anytime you change the runtime you have to restart so let's go ahead and restart now we get back and then when we run this we have this device cuda so we now using our gpu before moving on to the training we are going to add this sigmoid function right here so let's have torch torch sigmoid and that's it then also at the level of this transformations we are going to include normalization so we have a the normalize and there we go we've commented this sharpen let's let's take the sharpen off so we have this um that's it we will run the cell so there we go let's visualize let's get this output you see still kind of like the same output we had and then we have this run okay notice that now instead of the what we had previously we have now this sigmoid backward and then we run this in our device so there we go we now start with the training we define this training method which takes in the number of epochs and so in here we are gonna have for epoch in epochs we define our epoch loss our epoch loss to be equal to zero and then for i then we have the image and the label in enumerate the train loader there we go we are gonna have this image which we are going to place in the device so we have image dot to device so notice how here we have this image and then we place it in the device guess what we're placing this actually in the gpu now uh, just here we could also place the model so we have model model dot to device so we place the model on the gpu and then we place the image in the gpu once we place this image and model on the gpu we can also do same for the level so we have level equal level dot two device so that's the image and level now on the gpu now recall that as we had said previously the inputs of a torch model are going to be like this 3 by 224 by 224 unlike with tensorflow where we're used to doing 224 by 224 by 3 so here we have h or width number of channels whereas here we have a uh, number of channels height and width so to convert like the images we get in now at this uh, of this form so to convert from this form to this form so that it could be passed into our model what we're going to do here is we're going to have this image which is going to be permutated so we have image equal torch dot permit and then in this permit we pass the image and then we specify this order of permutation now if you have an input like this one then obviously you will have a batch dimension so here we let's have the batch and here we have the batch let's add this to it right here batch and here we have the batch now if you have to leave from say this here to this notice that you have this zero year one year two year three so if you have to uh, maintain the position you will see that the batch uh, position remains the same so we have zero now if you want to get from this to this um, notice how this third value this third index gets to the first position so we now have zero three so this three gets to this position this h which is one gets to the second position so we now have two or rather instead we now have one so yeah we should have one since this h is one it, go, it gets to this position so we now have one and then this w gets to this position we now have two 
So that's how we permute this into this. So that said, let's take this off and then write that out here. So we put out zero and then three and then one and then two. So that's it, we've permitted this input image. We've put it in the device and then we have our level. From here, we could initialize our weights to zero. So we have optimizer dot zero grad and that's all we need to do. Now, notice we had defined this optimizer right here and we had passed the model parameters. So here we have optimizer.zero-grad and once you, you, you do this initialization, you can now get the output. So with this, we're gonna have output equal model and which takes in this image. So it takes in our image now and then we have the output. Now, once we have this output, the next thing we wanna do is pass this in our loss function. So we get the loss, we have loss function, which takes in the output, output and the level. Now, if you check out the definition for this loss function here, that's this BCE, you would find that what we have to pass first here is an input and a target input. So since we aim at getting the label values, that's we aim at getting these true values, we have this label set out here. And then since what the model produces this output, we put it in here. So that's it, we get our loss. And then from after getting this loss, we do a backward propagation. So we have loss.backward. And then after this, we do optimizer, this same optimizer, but now dot step. So where we modify the model parameters. So that's it, we have our optimizer or we have our parameters modified. We update our epoch loss. So we have epoch loss plus equal loss dot item. Now the loss we get is from this loss here. So we get this loss values and we add it up to the epoch loss. Recall our epoch loss is initialized to zero. So now we just keep stacking up all those loss values and then what we do is for each and every step length, now we're gonna define the step length here. We could define the step length, our step length to be the length of our train loader, and then we divide this by two. So we have this step length we wanna get, and then for every time or for every step, we're gonna print out the epoch, the current epoch number, print out the step with respect to all the number of data points we've trained on with respect to the full data set and then we're going to print out the loss so from here once we print out this loss we could also now that's after like once we're done with this particular batch and we could get out of this year and then print out the loss for this epoch so loss for um epoch number or whatever epoch number it is is the epoch loss, that is the epoch loss, um, our epoch loss divided by the length of our train loader. So we wanna, we wanna have this, we wanna have this um, printed out. So we have the loss for, for epoch number, this is this. Now with the formatting, we are gonna pass in the current epoch. So we have epoch, Rather we have epoch. So we have the epoch, just like with this epoch plus one. So we have the epoch, and then we have the epoch loss, which we've been adding up as we went through this particular batch. Or for each and every batch, we kept on adding up these values. And then once we take this, we divide by the total length of our train loader, and we get the loss for the full epoch. Now, once we have that, we could treat the accuracy. So we could print out the accuracy values. But to print out the accuracy values, we need to be able to get this accuracy first. That said, just right here, we are gonna get the accuracy. Or let's say we have the accuracy, which is equal get accuracy. So we'll define this get accuracy method. And we have our get accuracy. What do we pass in this get accuracy? Really nothing, since we've defined all this already here. So we are just gonna create this our uh, get accuracy method. Now let's um, add this code cell here. We have get accuracy. And then in this get accuracy method, it's gonna be quite similar to what we've done already here. So let's just copy this out. 
uh, we copy all this out and then in here paste it out so in this get accuracy we start by specifying that we are in evaluation mode we are not really training the model so we in evaluation mode and then torch dot no grad with actually with touch dot no grad we are gonna uh, have all this in this scope here so with touch dot no grad we have the image which we get um no firstly we have to do this like we have to go through the, the train loader again so with touch the no grad we're gonna go through the train loader now what we could do is we could just do this by testing on the validation at one so let's test on the validation that is let's get the, the the loss from the train and then the accuracy from the validation so we could do that very quickly so we have that and then we put this in here let's get back here let's take this off and there we go now we no longer need this level we no longer need to uh, initialize our weights we now just need our output so here we get our output and then we are ready to compute this accuracy so here we are gonna have just like with the loss our uh, epoch accuracy so we set this to zero and then each time we get this output we compute the accuracy and keep on increasing that epoch accuracy so yeah let's have that and then for uh in range the line of our output if we have the output i the item we get that equal the label label i that item what we're gonna do here is we're gonna have epoch accuracy epoch accuracy plus equal one so we increase that epoch accuracy now the problem with this is that if our output is say 0 0.3 uh obviously we we have we we consider this to be a zero and even if our level is a zero we are not going to get into this because 0 0.3 is not equal to zero so we're going to define a method which will convert all values less than 0 0.5 to be zeros and all values greater than or equal to 0 0.5 to be one so let's have this round function any value greater than or equal to 0 0.5 is one any value less than that 0 0.5 is zero so we run this cell and then um yeah we pass in round round of this output and uh, that's it so we have round of this output and once we're done with adding up all this here we can now print out the accuracy so we could see here the accuracy for this epoch is now what we could do now is pass in the epoch number here so we just say the current epoch we have epoch and then in here we pass in epoch so here we have epoch so this accuracy is the accuracy for this epoch uh, whatever epoch it is is um now the value we're gonna get is the sum total of all this because recall that if you have a data set of twenty seven thousand elements we are gonna go through each and every or let's say you have a validation data of five thousand elements we're gonna go through each and every one of those five thousand elements and compare the output with the expected output so for if if for all these 5,000 elements we have the output being equal the label that's the true output being equal the predicted output then in that case we should have a hundred percent accuracy and so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna have this to be so we format this we're gonna have the epoch first and then we're gonna have a hundred or oh, let's let's start by saying we're gonna have this epoch accuracy which we've been adding up divided by the length of the validation loader so obviously if this epoch accuracy equal 5000 it means for each and every element we had or we got into this and if we get into this for each and every element it means the output always match the level so that's it that's how we get this here and then we simply modi multiply this by a hundred so we have that everything looks fine and then we close this here so that's it we printed out our accuracy let's take this off now and then run this cell so we run the cell looks fine we run this training cell we can now go ahead and train so let's start with say two epochs um make sure there are no bugs. so let's run that we told you that model reference before assignment now let's check out our model 
oh yeah it's actually just model to device so we put the model to device just like that so that's it let's run this again and see what we get we obtain this other error int object is not iterable so uh, just in here we should have range range epochs so that's it so uh, for epoch in range epochs we should have that we run again and then we told that using the target size of uh, this torch size 4 that is different to the input size torch size 4 by 1 so we have this 2d input and this 1d target size is duplicated please ensure that ensure they have the same size now what you actually see here is if we check out our label so let's print out our label and our output before getting to the loss so let's print out let's print out output dot shape and then label dot shape let's run that again okay so here we see clearly exactly what you're talking about you're saying that we are having this output which is um 2d and this input which is 1d and what we could do here is make sure that this 1d turns to a 2d and we maintain this so we have the output which is 4 by 1 and then the label we can modify it to be 4 by 1 2 now to modify this label to 4 by 1 we could use the unsqueeze operator or method so here we have label and then right here we have label okay we have label equal torch dot unsqueeze unsqueeze and then we have the label so there we go we have this level we specify the last um dimension so if you have for example let's say you have this suppose we have um four so we have this shape here and then you want to unsqueeze that means you want to add an extra dimension um of size equal one then saying negative one means you're taking this last position and then you're adding this extra dimension now if you had specified zero you would have one comma four so recall we started we're starting out from this we started out from this and then in the case where we specify negative one as our parameter we should have this in the case where we specify zero as our parameter then we have this so that's how it works now let's take this off we have those two matching we will print again this output and this level so you could see exactly what we get there now let's run this and then run our train we see at least here that we have this which match now and then we get in this new arrow found d type double but expected flute this is um, related to this loss you can see here related to the loss so what we will do is at the level of this level because here we have our level we are going to convert this level into a float so we have level equal level dot float so let's run that let's now take off the shapes let's take off the shapes and train after two epochs here's what we get we see the loss which is dropping but this accuracy has a problem so let's check out on that now here you could just call this get accuracy since we've already printed out those values instead of the val loader we should have val data set as a val data set gives us the length of the full validation data set whereas the val loader has a length equal the full data set divided by the batch size so here we should have this let's modify this a bit so we should have a hundred times this so we have a hundred times the epoch accuracy divided by the length of the full data set now this should work fine we have that fine uh, we run this run this tool and start training training now complete here are the results we obtain you'll see that they're quite similar to what we have with tensorflow so here after the first epoch we have this loss 0 0.5 drop to 0 0.26 0 0.19 20 epoch we are having a loss of 0 0.09 now for the validation accuracy we have a, an accuracy we start from 92.4 percent 14 epoch we have an accuracy of 95.2 percent so here's our highest accuracy so far and that said we'll see how we get very similar results with tensorflow Thank you for getting right up to this point and see you next time.